Good evening and welcome to Primetime Lawmakers, GPB's nightly coverage of the Georgia General Assembly. It's the ninth legislative day of the 2012 session. I'm Scott Slade and coming up in tonight's program, committee hearings begin for a constitutional amendment to allow Georgia to create state-sponsored charter schools. The state Supreme Court found state charter schools unconstitutional last year. Some Democrats say Georgia's immigration law, HB 87, has hurt farming and the economy. They are calling for repeal of the law. We'll take a look back at the week under the Gold Dome from budget briefings to ethics reform. It's all here, and I'll be joined by two legislative experts tonight to put this week's Capitol News in perspective for you. Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report and Chuck Clay of Brock Clay. Our update from the Capitol is coming up in just a moment. But first, the lone independent in the State House, Representative Rusty Kidd, has introduced legislation to allow anyone convicted of a DUI to expunge their record after five years if they commit no other offenses. He tells primetime lawmakers he introduced the bill in part to help keep young people from ruining their lives. I'll give you an example of why something like this is needed. Uh, a teenager, 17, 18 years old, goes to his girlfriend's house for New Year's Eve. The, her parents serve him a glass of champagne. He goes home at 1 o'clock. He has a busted taillight. Policeman pulls him over. Because he was a minor, he's taken to jail, arrested, and given a DUI. And that DUI today never comes off his record. It keeps him from getting into law school. It keeps him from getting certain grant programs. He prohibits him from getting certain jobs because he had a DUI registered point 001002 when he was 17 years old. That's not right. Something needs to be done to uh, give that person a second chance. Representative Kidd says his bill is still a work in progress and he would not be opposed to excluding those who have multiple DUI convictions. His bill has been assigned to the House Judiciary Non-Civil Committee. Now let's go back to the Capitol where San primetime lawmaker Sandra Parrish says House Democrats held a public hearing this afternoon on their proposal to repeal the immigration law, HB 87. Good evening, Sandra. Good evening, Scott. You may remember earlier this week, House Democrats laid out their legislative priorities for this session. Among them was repealing the controversial immigration reform law that legislators passed last session. Today, members of the Democratic caucus heard directly from those who've been impacted by the law. HB 87 is a fail attempt at immigration reform that hasn't simply served to cripple Georgia's economy. Representative Pedro Marin is leading the effort to repeal HB 87. Democrats also want to delay implementation of the E-Verify system to 2015 for those businesses with 50 or more employees. All we're asking for is relief. Give us an opportunity to prepare and get ourselves ready and let the economy grow some. Lawmakers heard testimony from one after another on the impact of the new law. We've actually realized now that anti-immigrant laws only serve to destroy the state economies of states like Georgia, but have also done so in Arizona, South Carolina, and Alabama. In fact, we think there's a direct connection between anti-immigrant laws, economic devastation, and uh, the economy going into the tubes. I've downsized my company by half and uh, moved and set up another company in an adjacent state. Um, and I'm sure that is extremely prevalent uh, among small businesses in Georgia. And I see that as the future for small businessmen in Georgia. But Representative Matt Ramsey, who authored HB 87 last year, accuses Democrats of playing politics. He says the law hasn't even been fully implemented. I think we're still looking at data. I think it's I, I think many suggestion about the impact has been has been a little bit overblown, given the fact that there were screams about this before the law was even in effect. Uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of complaints and concerns before the law e even had been uh, been effective yet. And we're going to continue to look to address the issues that are posed in Georgia, the social and economic issues posed in Georgia by illegal immigration, and we're not going to retreat from that position. Now, this was the first of several regularly scheduled public hearings House Democrats plan to hold this session. The next one, Scott, will be on Monday at 2.30 on the Hope Scholarship. Reporting live, I'm Sandra Parrish for Primetime Lawmakers. Yeah, it's certainly a hot button issue there. Sandra, bring us up to speed of what they'll be looking at in that Monday hearing on Hope. What are they looking at actually doing about it? We well, you know, Scott, we, in some of those priorities that the House Democrats had laid, laid out earlier this week, among those was dropping the GPA to a 2.5 for the technical college students who receive the HOPE grant. There was another proposal by uh, Democrats, Senate Democrats, that would actually do away with the GPA requirement altogether. Uh, the House side version is a little differently just to drop it lower, but of course Re Republicans say they don't plan to, uh, to put any kind of restrictions on it so far. We'll wait, have to wait and see 
see, though, what turns out this session. But the bottom line is they're looking at a way to, to parcel out the, the dwindling hope funds. Is, exactly. Is the bottom line. Thank right. you very much. That's, that's going to be well attended. We'll be able to cover it, that's for sure. Right. Well, if you ever thought a couple of raindrops uh, would keep Georgia's senior citizens away from the Capitol, think again. Uh, primetime lawmakers Jackie Britton tells us why those seniors were so motivated. Be There for Seniors was one rally held at the state capitol today that was not sparked by anger, but by gratitude to Governor Nathan Deal on keeping senior services funding in the budget. When the budget came out this year, the governor's recommended budget, the aging cuts that had been in there were all put back. So our aging services have been restored. And so the last three or four years, we had not had that opportunity. We typically had to be down here asking for that money. The event was organized by AARP Georgia, along with many other senior service agencies. State senators and representatives were also on hand to show their support. I can assure you that your voice is being heard. We are doing a great deal or as much as we can to keep from cutting uh, essential services. With the population in Georgia growing, so is the demand for senior services. But that didn't stop this group from traveling all the way to the state capitol on an overcast day in Atlanta to maintain awareness and keep their budget safe. Our seniors are living at home and they need services in their home. If we don't serve them in the home, they end up going into nursing homes and facilities where they're not as happy. It also costs taxpayers more money. Many people in the crowd brought signs of seniors in an effort to showcase just a few of the people who would be affected if funding was denied to them. So as a thank you. I want to first say that I love Governor Deal and all us seniors do. We all appreciate everything that he's doing for the state of Georgia, especially for us seniors. Of course, the final story on funding for senior services won't be told until the 2013 budget is passed by both houses and signed into law by Governor Deal. Reporting for lawmakers, I'm Jackie Britton. Thank you, Jackie. Seniors show up at the Capitol and they show up at the polls, too. Long white lab coats fill the Gold Dome inside and out today. Nurses from across the state came to the Capitol for the annual Georgia Nurses Association's Legislative Day. Nurses met with Governor Nathan Deal and Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle for a group photo. They also attended a House and Senate session in person. The GNA has approximately 2,000 members statewide. We're going to take a little break on primetime lawmakers, but don't go anywhere. It's the end of the week, and that means we'll take a look at the week under the Gold Dome, plus analysis and commentary of all the important capital news with Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report and Chuck Clay of Brock, uh, Chuck Clay of Brock Clay. We'll also take a look at the move uh, that might bring uh, charter schools back under the state umbrella. So don't go anywhere. The House Education Committee today heard testimony on a resolution that would amend the state constitution to give the General Assembly the power to establish statewide education policy. Kiosha Howard joins us live at the Capitol with more on that. Good evening, Kiosha. Good evening, Scott. This was all brought about by a Supreme Court decision that overturned a measure that the General Assembly passed last year to allow the state to create charter schools. Those charter schools would receive local funding, but the Supreme Court voted that the measure was unconstitutional. Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones, who is sponsoring the amendment, says the Supreme Court decision limits the General Assembly's power to make special cha several changes to education, not just with regards to charter schools. They went broader than just charter schools. They also um, uh, eliminated the state's role in that partnership with local school boards and parents to make sure that we have adequate education. So it would also clarify the Constitution and make clear that the state can establish statewide uh, policies, including uh, a, a statewide teacher salary schedule, uh, class sizes, a statewide curriculum. There is opposition to, to giving the General Assembly authority over educational policy. Some say that it would dismantle the school system. That, uh, what we call enabling legislation, would look very similar to what it did back in 2008, which passed the House by a constitutional majority, 120 votes, uh, probably would make some very small tweaks to it to reflect uh, newer, better, later information, but they would be very modest. And in fact, uh, a couple of them are, have been suggested to me by several of my colleagues in the Democratic Party. And in the clip that we just saw, that was Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones letting, um, letting everyone know that she is prepared, along with some members of the Democratic Party actually, to come up with new legislation um, to 
pretty much bring forth that legislation again that the Supreme Court ruled as unconstitutional. She tells me that she plans to drop that legislation as early as next week. Um, but the opposition to the bill comes from several uh, people, especially on the educator side. They are saying they believe that the uh, that if the the state is given this power, um, that they will lose some control and that it would ruin public education. Uh, thank you so much, Scott. I'm reporting live from the state capitol for primetime lawmakers. I'm Kiosha Howard. All right, thank you very much, Kiosha. Appreciate that. We'll be watching that and we'll be watching what happened this week under the Gold Dome. Analysis is coming up with a couple of experts. Chuck Clay, Tom Crawford, we'll be back to run it all down for you next. Welcome back to Primetime Lawmakers. Four day weeks during the legislative session do feel like a long week. Kiosha Howard has all the details of what happened under the Gold Dome with the Week in Review. The 2013 fiscal year. My fiscal year 2013 recommendation funds enrollment in our K through 12 and higher education. It fills Medicaid holes. It funds growth. It provides additional prison beds and includes required contributions to our state health benefit plans and our retirement systems. Outside of funding this growth, my budget recommendation calls for increased spending of three-tenths of 1%. Senate Minority Leader Chip Rogers unveiled legislation that would make it harder for local governments to create broadband services on Monday. Private sector businesses, the private sector workers, the private sector economy uh, is handling this exceptionally well, can continue to handle this exceptionally well. And what they don't need is for a governmental entity to come in and compete with them where these type of services already exist, and particularly compete with them sometimes when they don't have to play by the same rules. And that's really what this says, is that we're not outlawing a local government entity doing this, but if they're going to compete, they need to play by the same rules. And they need to go to the voters and ask the voters if it's okay that they spend all these dollars before they go out and spend them. Also on Legislative Day 6, the Senate granted final passage to a bill that makes it easier to give subpoenas in other states. It eliminates the need for you to go to the judge in another state and have a subpoena issued. You can go to your local judge and get the subpoena and then just go to the clerk of court in the out-of-state uh, district to take that deposition. Senate Democrats unveiled their legislative agenda for the session in a press conference on Monday. They listed the HOPE scholarship as a top priority. Just as there was when HOPE began, there will be an income cap. In addition to the academic requirements that are there that ensure that it goes to the highest achieving and the best and brightest students, this cap will be set each year and it will be set as high as possible to maximize the lot number of students who get the Full Hope Scholarship. House Minority Leader Stacey Abrams gave us a sneak peek of the House Democrats' legislative agenda. Georgia Democrats in the House believe that while we appreciate the direction the governor has taken, we think that there's room for a lot of common sense legislation that can really affect people's lives today. And so we're going to focus on three areas, economic security, educational opportunity, and shared responsibility. And on Tuesday, the seventh legislative day, the House Democrats revealed their priorities, including changes to the HOPE grant requirements and the repeal of an immigration reform measure that passed last year. Unfortunately, the change in the GPA to a 3.0 has resulted in more than 4,000 students losing the HOPE grant for Technical College. The Restore and Build Hope Act will change the requirement required, the GPA requirement required for students at technical colleges to a 2.5 to retain the Hope Grant. HB 87 is a failed attempt at immigration reform that has served to simply cripple the economy of Georgia. It has rippled across the state and has made us the laughing stock in the nation. Also on Tuesday, Georgia Alliance for Ethics Reform rallied in support of a measure that would put a cap on how much money lobbyists can spend on legislators. We think Georgians need to step up and let them know that this is the cap that they want, that they need to see a limit on lobbyist gifts. This bill does that and the leadership needs to support it. House Speaker David Ralston responded on Wednesday saying that he opposes the measure and that it will not do away with the practice of lobbying. If anybody believes that if, uh, if we adopt some of these measures that lobbying is going to go away, then uh, I've got some oceanfront property in Blue Ridge, I'll sell them, uh, because it's not going to go away. This, you know, the law, that the system that we have now enables Georgians to see 
you know, who, who is lobbying and where the intensity of the effort is at. Speaker Ralston also made a very rare appearance on Wednesday when he attended a meeting of the Special Committee on Small Business Development and Job Creation to stress the need of making it easier for small businesses. I've heard from one end of the state to the other from small business owners that they're drowning under red tape, uh, uh, d duplicative uh, uh, forms that they have to submit to various state agencies and departments. Uh, um, and and um, uh, I think this is a problem. I think it's a problem that's worthy of our uh, attention right now. Chief Justice Carol Hunstein also delivered the annual State of the Judiciary Address on Wednesday, saying that the state needs accountability courts. Georgia Special Counsel recommending, recommends giving judges more sentencing options by creating a statewide system of accountability courts, which include drug courts, mental health courts, and veterans courts. These accountability courts have a proven track record of holding offenders accountable while reducing their likelihood of reoffending. And that's this week under the Gold Dome. Man, thanks for that, Kiosha. So we just saw it's been a packed week full of budget talk, plans for hope, ethics reform, immigration law uh, repeal. A lot going on for a second week in the General Assembly. And to put it into perspective this evening, I'm joined by Tom Crawford, editor of the Georgia Report. Tom's been covering state politics for 30 years. And by Chuck Clay, a former state senator and senior partner at Brock Clay. Both men know of what they speak. And why don't we speak of something that we saw a little earlier this evening, this move toward uh, amending the state constitution to allow state control of charter schools. Chuck, is that going anywhere? It's hanging by a thread in the sense that it takes a two-thirds vote, uh, so you have no margin of, of, of error. It's been a sort of a, uh, an axiom, if you will, of Republican leadership that there needs to be options for charter schools other than simply a local charter. Uh, right now, I'd say they're a vote or two short on both sides. Uh, of course, that's always subject to change, but uh, I don't think you'll see this on either floor unless they know they have the votes to pass it. Look, Tom, you're nodding your head over there. No, I'm agreeing with Chuck. Uh, you get into the issue of local control versus state control over this, which is a age-old conflict on, on, on the school issue. So uh, for that reason alone, I think it'll be a close vote. Yeah. But, but we might even see if this winds up coming to, to fruition. Someone could either argue for or against entire school systems becoming charter systems. I think Fulton County Schools has nibbled around the edges on that, haven't They're they? Certainly looking and doing that, uh, uh, and that's a very serious option. It's a different one, though. Right. Uh, this one sort of cuts that idea that their people are being turned down arbitrarily and it gives them an avenue to go to the state. It cuts across party lines because there are Republicans that are uncomfortable with the local control right. issue and there are Democrats who very much support the idea of being able to go to the state. So it's an interesting yeah. uh, vote lineup. As long as people are paying for school systems with local property taxes, they want a dog in that fight, don't they? And they all will. Yeah, let's talk about the budget for a second. Budget briefings uh, just uh, concluded and of course that is the one constitutional responsibility of the state legislature. Are there any really big fights or are there, is there a lack of fights because there's such a lack of money? I don't see any big fights developing here. Everybody seems to be pretty much on board with what the governor wants. Uh, I think we talked about this before. There are small amounts of money to put into this issue and that issue, but there is not enough money there to make the kind of really big, bold reform effort that a lot of governors like to make. As I said, there's a little money. Everybody seems to be on board or pretty much on board with what the governor wants, which is one of the major reasons why they may be able to get this session ended by the end of March, which I know is a big goal of leadership right now. Hmm. Chuck? Yeah, uh, uh, there's a little bit of collective sigh of, of hope that maybe we've rounded the worst of the recession. Uh, Health care, Medicaid, Peach Care, TANF continue to just pull additional dollars out of that budget. I do think there's going to be a modest push on some economic development tools, energy tax, maybe an investment fund that would help industries like the Georgia Bioscience, which is an area that the governor wants to grow, that we're losing occasionally to competitive states. Uh, they want to look at a little uh, uh, sort of enhanced tax code and incentives to make sure that businesses that start here uh -huh. stay here. But it has to be paid for. And right yet, that's a little too early to say. Well, one of the biggest initiatives is, is the move to uh, re repeal or exempt the sales tax on energy yes. as, as a throughput <clears throat> for manufacturing. Manufacturers yeah. saying mm -hmm. that next to labor could be their biggest cost. Right. Uh, is there a possibility of that? And do you agree with that 100 to $140 million potential price tag for that? 
Go ahead. I'm well, I think the uh, the cost estimate on repealing the energy tax, uh, according to the governor's people, is right around 154 million a year. Oh, more than I thought. Okay. And you do have to come up with revenues to offset that because we are required constitutionally to balance the budget. But I think that's the one tax change or tax break that has a pretty good chance of getting through this session because there does seem in both parties to be support for it. And because it's really connected to jobs, isn't it? it yeah. Absolutely. That's one. There's a direct correlation. You still have to pay for it. You have to pay for it in year one. You can't wait to year three, four, and five where you hopefully that creates an incentive for maybe businesses to stay. And again, a classic we, between uh, Emory and Georgia Tech and the University of Georgia, we incubate a lot of high-tech bioscience industries here. We need to keep them here when they start moving into the manufacturing profitable stage to mm -hmm. create jobs. So. There's no partisan issue on this. I think it's a question, can they pay for it? Well, one right. of the cheapest things you could do right off the bat would be to reduce regulation on business, to make it a little easier for them to operate there. Were you impressed with the speaker actually showing up at a committee <laughs> hearing to testify <laughs> on that? Oh, uh, I always used to say when Murphy would occasionally do that mm -hmm. years ago, he'd, well, you know, watch out or go ahead and just cast the vote because the, the yeah. issue's done over and uh, That's right. uh, voted on. It's always important, and I don't know necessarily the details be worked out over time as to what those things might be, but anything that reduces the kind of unnecessary paperwork that occurs is a good thing. Okay. Another issue here, and it is sort of a, a local issue, but it involves traffic and uh, a rare uh, breed, a Democrat from Gwinnett County, Senator Kurt Thompson, <laughs> has proposed a moratorium on any future HOT express lane projects like the one that's running uh, in Gwinnett County. What is it about the third rail of increasing the fuel tax? And this all goes back to sure. the state of trying to find new forces of revenue. Why doesn't anyone say, hey, the fuel tax is, is so low? You were there for those kind, some of those kinds of battles. No one will even talk about that. It has been one of those issues, and it becomes almost a, 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 a psychological. But when you talk, and this goes back many, 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 many years, but something about the gas tax, if anybody talks about increasing the gas tax mm -hmm. in any form, it is one that brings out more ire and anger almost than any other issue out there, even if in the reality at the mm -hmm. pump, it doesn't make a, 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 a really a significant difference, mm -hmm. but it has been one that has become an emotional rail and it has almost become untouchable and gas is gonna have to get a good bit more expensive until people say, Let's do something different. Mm -hmm. Because grass revenues are going down. As the price is going up, our yep. gas tax revenue are actually declining. Well, people are driving less. They yes. are. And they're, and they're using more fuel efficient trucks and cars, Absolutely. too. And that, that's, that's, that's hurting the bottom line. It has been. Let's go on to a different subject. Uh, arguing for the repeal of uh, HB 87, the immigration law. Tom, is that realistically <laughs> going anywhere? No, it's not. Uh, and it, it, came into the news again this week with the uh, disclosure that one of the prized recruits of coach Mark Richt at the University of Georgia, a big offensive lineman from down in Hinesville along the coast, was refused entrance to the University of Georgia because he cannot document that he was born in the United States and under a you know, get tough on immigrants policy adopted by the university system, they had no choice but to deny him entrance. So. Uh, it sort of put a human face on the issue and it showed people it can really hurt a lot of folks if you put a strong policy like this into effect, but I still do not see an appetite on the leadership to go back and revisit it, the law, in any major way. Even for a 340 pound freshman lineman. I was going to say, yes. you know, mess with the economy, don't mess with the dogs. Uh, <laughs> if anything could, uh, uh, it is, I think there are quietly, people do realize Gary Black, our agriculture commissioner, mm -hmm. is very sincere and I think as they're hoping to defuse this, they can come back with maybe a regulatory framework in conjunction either with mm -hmm. the federal government or a variety of other southeastern states that deal with a familiar mm -hmm. uh, worker issue mm -hmm. and maybe take some of the emotional sting out of it. Short term, no. Judicial reform, and a lot of that is hung on the cost of locking all these people up. Uh, the Chief Justice made her pitch this week. What do you think? The, the governor is absolutely committed to penal reform, which in, in short is a way of trying to say we can warehouse them, but if we can break the cycle through drug courts, through s earlier intervention, working with juveniles, in the long term you're going to save a bunch of money. He's correct. Mm -hmm. In this day and time, we cannot pay to warehouse every criminal. Uh, uh, who commits a crime in the state of Georgia. And that's not being soft on crime, mm -hmm. that's just being bluntly realistic. You don't let the really bad guys go, you gotta do better up front to break the drug addictions, mm -hmm. the alcohol addictions, those type of things that always bring 
folks and, back to and court. And finally, Tommy, even a move to potentially decriminalize traffic mm -hmm. offenses, mm -hmm. uh, making them uh, non-misdemeanors, below misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. Will there be some resistance to that? There's some resistance to that from uh, city officials. That they tell me that if you don't make tra traffic offenses a criminal offense, we've got no leverage to use against people to make them pay their fines. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not a bad argument, but I think the push is still on to decriminalize some of these uh, particular offenses. It's great you look check. at the ones that come to traffic court on the yeah. criminal offense versus those who get the automatic tickets that go uh -huh. through the camera. Uh -huh. uh, that pay drops off real fast. Oh, boy, there is a stick there. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us this evening. <laughs> Appreciate pleasure, you being here as always. Lawmakers will not be seen tomorrow because the Georgia General Assembly will not be in session. We'll be back Monday, January 30th for Legislative Day 10, and next week is Education Week on Primetime Lawmakers. Monday, we'll feature a discussion of the top 10 issues to watch with Steve Dollinger, the Georgia Partnership for Education, Excellence in Education. It's going to be an informational week, so make an appointment to join us. If you missed any part of this broadcast, it repeats tomorrow morning at 5.30. Coming up next to GPP, Georgia Outdoors. Tonight, see a massive effort to save the gopher frog population with host Sharon Collins. Georgia Outdoors is coming up next to GPB. And that's our broadcast for this ninth legislative day of the 2012 session. I'm Scott Slade. Be sure and join us Monday night at 7 for primetime lawmakers. Enjoy this rainy night in Georgia. This is a GPB original production.